So welcome. We save the best for last. <laughs> That's how when my wife does when we, we eat dinner. She always keeps the last great nuggets for, for the last. And my God, if I steal that last nugget from her, oh man, it's ground for divorce. So welcome. I hope you guys have had a great couple of days out here. I know I have. Uh, it's great to be back in person, fraternizing with all the peeps. Community is awesome. It's kind of funny how all the company colors goes out the window when we enter events like this. I love it. So my name is Jens Madsen. I do work for a company, pretty irrelevant today, but um, I'm here to talk about emergency calling. It's one of my passions, if you can say it's a passion, but it's something that I've seen there on deployments is one of the more complex things to deal with. Um, voice routing is freaking easy but dealing with having to think through various scenarios when you're dealing with emergency calling and stemming a little, sit, little bit outside of the technology too and, and how the technology supports us becomes very important. And it's something that shouldn't be overlooked because we're dealing with people's lives here, right? Um, five areas. What's the problem statement? We have new FCC regulations, finally. I'm a big proponent of regulations because it makes people accountable. Uh, we've had many years where we had a bunch of state regulations and everything was a mismatch and, well, who should do this and who should do that, but Having the FCC actually tell us what we need to do now, I think is a good thing. Um, that's my personal view of it. Talk a little about the different ways we can do 911. A little bit about configuration. I'm not going to take you through a, a, a full configuration, but talk a little bit about some of the obstacles and some of the things to look out for when you are doing your configurations, and then a little bit about practical items. So some of these things here are kind of mind-boggling, right? We have over this, we have almost 6,000 PSAPs. How do we make sure that my call ends up at the right PSAP? Because we all work from home, right? We're all on the road. Work is not some place you go to anymore. It's something you do. And you do it from, from anywhere. 80% of 911 calls come from wireless devices. Wow. Domino's knows where to deliver a pizza, but we don't know where the heck to send an ambulance. What's wrong with that picture, right? So we've got some new regulations. Some of them are based on carrier's laws. Some of them are on the Ray Baums Act. I'm not going to get into which is who and who's what, but it's all now consolidated in a document called FCC 19-76. And there's some paragraphs in there. There's five areas we need to be aware of. Carrier's law is direct 911 dialing. We need to be able to support 911 direct dialing. No trunk codes, no eight in front of it, no nine in front of it, none of that stuff. You pick up the handset, you dial 911, you're gonna get your PSAP. Not some PSAP, but your PSAP, right? That went into effect in 2020. MLTS notification, MLTS is multi-line telephone system. So it is something that's defined, it's a, a, 
um, something that's defined by the FCC. It's a multi-line telephone system. It is what we call a PBX. It is what Teams is. It's the telephony system. You have to be able to do notification. There's a loophole. We'll get to that. If your system can't do that, FCC says, that's okay. But if it can, you have to enable it. The special location for on-premises fixed telephones, that's what we are calling static E911. E911 is enhanced 911, and it means that when you are calling PSAP, the public service answering points, when you're calling them, you're also providing an address that's associated with that phone number. So for, for fixed devices, it can be very easy to do because you simply just map a, an address to a telephone number. If you know that that telephone is not moving around, you're fine, fixed devices. Dispatchable location for on-premises non-fixed devices. Well, what's that? That's when you're running around with your laptop. You're in an organization and you have multiple floors or you have multiple branches. And this week, I'm working out of Texas. Next week, I'm working out of New York. My phone number becomes inconsequential of my address. And how do I now provide my address when I'm calling 911? So we've been able to do that for a long time when we're on premises with both Skype for Business, Link, and Teams. We have ways to do that. The next one that's coming up is how are we going to provide an address when we're at Starbucks? I'm working out at Denny's. I like my breakfast there. I want to eat at home. My wife's a lousy cook, so I go to Denny's. So, so what do we do? You know, when you're at Denny's and you call 911 from your, your laptop or your cell phone, how are they going to know where you are, right? So we don't have that yet on Teams, but FCC says you must have this by January 2020, or 20, sorry, January 2022. So right now, this is rolling out. Uh, we used to have it on Skype. You would manually pop in your address when you're at home. It would match the gateway MAC address, kind of being sticky, remembering it. So we kind of had that on Skype for Business. The problem with what we had on Skype for, for Business was that that address wasn't really validated. I could put in 123 Disneyland Road and, you know, system would accept that. And now how am I going to, you know, route that call, right? So this is coming. Uh, it's rolling out right now. I haven't seen it yet in any tenants, but it's rolling out October, November for commercial and GCC, GCC High and DOD. They're just going to make the deadline by by January of next year. So again, we talked about it. <clears throat> kind of just reaffirm, direct dialing 911 carries law. No digit in front of 911. We have to be able to just lift the handset, dial 911, and out we go. Notification, again, the law is you have to notify somebody else if somebody within your organization is calling 911, and it's important for a couple of reasons. Number one reason is you want somebody to run down to that person who is in need and start providing first aid. The second reason is you want somebody else to run out on the street waiting for the first responses to come into the building and being able to navigate these guys into where your patient is, right? But there's a loophole. If the system is able to be configured to provide the notification without an improvement to the hardware and software of the system. And we'll get to that later. So it's kind of a soft rule. But you're always gonna go, you always want to go above and beyond because we're dealing with people's lives here, right? On premises fixed telephones, yep, non issue because you can do a sticky address to a phone number. The phone doesn't move, no big deal. 
Non-fixed devices, again, that's the laptop. You keep moving around. Companies are moving away from cubicles into we've got shared office space, and I don't know which floor I'm working on today or which building I'm in. It's, it's, it's a non-issue on Teams if you do your due diligence when you're deploying um, your telephone system. The next one is this off-premises stuff. This is what's just rolling out. So provide the appropriate PSAP automated dispatchable location when technically feasible. Again, loopholes, right? But Microsoft is taking this seriously and says, we don't like loopholes, so let's, let's do it the right way. So this means that when you're working off-site, you have devices that nowadays are GPS capable. Your laptop, your, your phone, so this applies to your mobile device, it applies to your uh, fat client on your laptop, it does not apply to your desk phone at this point. I'm hoping this is coming, uh, but if you're taking a phone home and you're using that phone at home, at home, you're still having a problem. The problem with cell phones calling 911, remember the previous slide where 80% of the the calls are coming from mobile handsets. The way that if you through your cell phone carrier are calling 911 right now, they're going to try to match your location based on radio triangulation. So that means they've got two or three radio towers that are matching and saying, oh, this is what person A is. That is highly inaccurate. If you're calling 911 from a team's mobile phone nowadays and you've validated your address through GPS, you're going to get a much better location match. So the edict of the past was, we don't know where you are, you're on teams. If you call 911, you better use your cell phone carrier to make that call. That's going to change now to where, no, you better pick up, use your team's client to make that call because Teams is going to be way more accurate at identifying where you are better than, than the cell phone carrier. All this stuff is only intended for the United States. Different countries have different rules. Dynamic E91, E911 is really only something we deal with in, in the U.S. In, the, in Europe, they have something called NG911, where on cell phones, for example, they have much better location information services. So if you are working abroad, look at the different countries, which region you're in, because there is different technology out there. Right. So the different methods. Let's start from the bottom up. Uh, ALI is based on your caller ID. It's a database that's maintained by the carriers. You say, here's the address that's associated with this phone number. It could be both an address and a sublocation, meaning an address and a suite number, an address and a building number, but you can really only use it for fixed telephones stuff that you know is going to stay in place. It's not going to move around. Then the SBC's vendors came up with this great thing called ELIN, Emergency Locating, blah, 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 blah. It's still using an ALI database. So what happens is that you are kind of swapping out the telephone number when somebody's calling 911, and you are using a static database, but you can kind of do some dynamic stuff. We got to scrap that out of the way again because if you're on premises, you can't use that technology. So that leaves us with what? We, there's emergency routing service providers. These are the intrados, the bandwidths, the guys who can actually get you to the right PSAP, public safety answering point, based on dynamically, where are you right now? Because in that call, in that SIP call, we're actually going to slipstream the address in there of where we are. So what does that look like? 
So ERSRPs, you know, I talked earlier in the, this last session about choose your telephone carrier wisely because not all carriers provides this. There's only a very few uh, um, operators that does uh, uh, emergency routing. And if your general carrier doesn't support this, then you have to go out and ad hoc another carrier onto your SBCs or your, your uh, circuits for just dealing with 911 calls. So when you go out there and, and select a carrier, you gotta ask them, do they have ERSP, you know, emergency routing services behind them, and can they do it dynamically? So Teams user, within the organization calls 911, Teams will then, based on your location, whether it be an IP subnet, whether it be a wireless access point, whether it be a switch port, uh, we have these identifiers during configuration that we do. We can, on premises, tell where you are down to the room in the building, right? And when we make that call, we're gonna inject that address into the SIP invite. So the invite that's going out to the carrier is gonna have a payload little XML markup with the actual civic address and the location within that address, whether that be first floor, second uh, uh, quadrant, or building 101 uh, basement. Um, ERS will route you to the right piece app. So if my phone number is an LA phone number, and I'm on the 213 area code, but I'm working out of New York today, doesn't matter because my 213 number will be presented to the PSAP, but with a New York address, right? PSAP will receive the address, location information, the sublocation, which floor I'm on, where I am in the building. If the call gets disrupted, they can call back on, I'm in New York, I called 911. They're gonna call me back on my 213 LA number. Fine, not a problem. They can call me back if that happens. Most of the emergency round service providers has a backup feature. If we can't match you to a location because either one, we didn't do a good enough job of doing the configuration, so there are subnets or buildings or something like that we missed during configuration or We've added new buildings, and nobody told the telecom team that we've got new switches and routers and new IP subnets out there. That call, or if you're working off-premises, because we don't know the IP addressing of your local Starbucks. So if you call 911 without a location match, the call will route to a national call center with, provide, or with agents that are trained to first thing ask for your physical address, based on that physical address, they will then reroute the call to the right PSAP. So great solution. We've got all the stuff we can do. We can do all our configuration, and there's a great fallback. So in the US, this is really only the one way you should do your E911 nowadays. There are other options, but again, you wanna go above and beyond because we're dealing with people's lives here, right? Eland, I'm giving that a yellow. Somebody calls 911. Teams can still determine the location of where you are exactly, and that's great for notification, but it's not great for routing. So I can notify the local people that I'm having a problem, and the local people will know my address. But from a carrier standpoint, because I don't have a real uh, a carrier, uh, uh, um, emergency carrier to route the call to the right piece app, I'm still relying on a static address that's mapped to a telephone number. So it's kind of network address translation for phone numbers. So what happens is your call will go out. The SBC is pre-programmed and says, 
I know your location, you fed me the location, but I'm going to swap your number with something that's been predefined in the ALI database with the carrier, and we're going to get you to the right PSAP. So now I'm a LA user with a 213 phone number, but I'm working out of New York. When I'm calling 911, the number that's presented to PSAP is going to be a New York area code associated with a New York address. Still, it works great if we have a location match, but it's not going to take care of us if we're working from Starbucks because we're not dynamically slipstreaming the address into the SIP invite. We're grabbing it from a database. It's a great way in Europe and other areas where uh, we can't do the slipstreaming, where we don't have the emergency routing service providers, but it's, it's, it's better than just being completely static. Okay. The last one, that's what's been going on for the last 30, 40 years. Your phone number is mapped to a location, mapped to an address, and it's fine if it's a common area phone, fine if we know that phone is not moving, nobody's moving around, and that's, that's okay. Questions so far? No? So, the first thing we do in Teams is we define civic addresses or emergency ad addresses. So, the Teams admin center allows you to do whatever you want. It's just the wild, wild west. You can put in whatever address you want. You don't have to worry about how you're crafting the address. But when you're working with uh, 911 providers, there's a certain way you want to craft those addresses. You always want to use the abbreviations. The only reason I'm showing you this address right now is I, I sold the house last month, so I don't care if you come. You know, I, there's a great pool in the backyard, and, but I, I don't live there anymore, so. <laughs> So I use Google quite a bit. If I'm in doubt, I'll put in, you know, you see I'm at Elmino's Drive. Well, the right way to do Elmino's Drive is not spell out drive. It's DR. It's WY for way. It's ST for street. It's Parkway is PKWY. Use the abbreviations. The Teams Admin Center doesn't care but when you come and you're working with a provider and you need to validate your addresses, which is the next step, they're going to say, that's crafted wrong. We don't know that address. There's a concept called MSAC, uh, MSAG, uh, Master Street Address Guide, that uh, addresses gets validated against. Here in the US, we, have, we can jump numbers in a street address. My neighbor is not necessarily the next number up. Where I grew up in Denmark, it was like, yeah, you've got one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven on that side of the street, and one, two, three, or one, <laughs> two, four, six, eight on that side of the street, and you don't drop numbers in your addresses. In the U.S., it's like, yeah, you, there may not, you can give me an address and. That doesn't exist, right? So, always be conscious about doing the right street suffix. Um, U.S. Postal Service has a good uh, guide on, on those suffixes. So, if you don't remember, you know, what circle, circle, circle. I can't remember. Go to USPS. They'll give it to you. Google Maps is pretty good at giving it to CI on top. I put in drive, and the address that comes up is, is DR, right? Uh, I tend to use Google over Bing, sorry Microsoft, but they're a little bit better at it. Say the name. We're in Kentucky. No, you're not. You're in Hopkinton. Yeah, but no. Damn it, we're in Kentucky. No, you're not. You're in Hopkinton. 
So again, you have a zip code, so you could have two different city names for it. My area, that happens too. I live in Saugus, I live in Valencia, but we all live in Santa Clarita, you know, so what's the right city name? And to be honest with you, you never know. So again, it's sometimes a crapshoot. Last time I checked that, what the record, typically it's the recommended city name from USPS that, that lines up with the MSAC. But it's funny, I pulled this up yesterday. I pulled this up about six weeks ago on a project I was work, working on, and it was reversed. So these things change. So again, you gotta get the val addresses validated when you're working with the carriers. When you do your configuration, get the address validated. So just something to look up, out for. That validated over there in the Teams Admin Center means absolutely nothing, okay? You need to make sure that the address, because look at this, I've got drive down here, and that's not the right way to specify drive, it's DR. But the Teams Admin Center said, yep, you validated. I go to my emergency routing carrier and they're gonna say, nope, not validated. That's not how we wanna see this. <laughs> so, means nothing, okay? Little more about uh, configuration. We set up our network topology in Teams. Uh, we're the Finding our subnets, our network range, and stuff, that is designed for your policies. Uh, for, it's designed for your emergency routing policy and your notification policy. It is not your location information that slipstream into your actual uh, SIP invite. It is just for your location policies. Name stuff right, okay? Yeah, this doesn't look pretty, but it makes sense. EIS is the business unit. This is a global organization with multiple businesses. So I've got a three letter code for the business unit. I've got a two letter code for the country I'm in. I've got a two letter code for the state I'm in got a three letter code for the city I'm in, and I always trail it with a serial number. I don't care how small the city is, but some cities like Los Angeles, New York, you're gonna open up more offices. You can't just say that we only have one New York office or one LA office because those regions or those cities are so big that you always wanna trail it with a serial number. So. Anytime you're dealing with naming conventions and teams, and this is just a little bit outside of it, really think it through and, and say, you know what, this organization may grow, right? So network and locations, this is where we don't have the subnet anymore. We don't have the, the slash. This is where we're getting, this is the area that's getting into what's actually mapped to the addresses that we're sending out. And again, do good descriptions, right? Because you're gonna get a big list of different freaking subnets and you've no idea where these subnets are and what they are. So again, going in and looking at, you know, well, easy, I can see this is EIS subdivision. We're in Germany, we're in Berlin, and this is Office 00. And this is the user data network or the Wi-Fi network, right? And this is what's gonna get mapped to the locations. Again, you can look at that from two views. You can go into the actual address and see what locations are mapped to that address, or you can look at it from the location side and see 
where those locate where those subnets are mapped to an address. So we have we have more items here. We also have we can go more granular. So we have IP subnets. I really encourage that everything is done by IP subnet. But you get into these situations where the customer is saying, well, we've got four floors, got 15 suites, got three buildings. Our wireless network is one subnet. Or our data network is one subnet. Well, how am I going to figure out where you are? So we have the ability to do that based on Wi-Fi access points, switches, and switch ports. So within a civic address, we can now say, up top we have the civic address, this is uh, the street name, this is the location, and then we have different areas within the address, right? So here we're dealing with multiple buildings that are at the same address. So we have a Riverside building, floor two, zone two, floor two, zone three, floor one, zone one, and so on and so forth. And then to each of those places, I'm associating either subnets, if I can, but a lot of times I have to go in and say, I'm going to look at MAC addresses for wireless access points or MAC addresses for switches that are being um, announced through LLDP, Link Layer Discovery Protocol. Okay. LLDP, Link Layer Discovery Protocol, every 30 seconds, your switch is going to make an announcement out on the port saying, this is the switch you're on, this is the port you're on. Great. Awesome. There's two ways that an LLD, uh, switch can announce LLDP, and I am absolutely not a networking guy. Uh, it will either show you a MAC address of that switch or an IP management address and you don't know which one. So you ask your customer, you ask, you do a Wireshark trace on it, that way I can look at the raw data dump and I can see, in this instance, they're using ad MAC addresses. I am also on port space two on this switch. So now I know that I'm dealing with MAC addresses when I'm making my configuration, and by the way, Teams, doesn't know what a colon and a MAC address is, it has to be a dash. So you, you, you got to deal with that. Another thing I found out was that at home I'm running Ubiquiti gear, and there's a space between the port and the number of the port. If I'm doing this in the Teams admin center, it will not allow me to do a space in my port number. Okay, I also talked to Jamie earlier and he said they've got some issues with some backslashes too, and a lot of Cisco gear is using backslashes in the port numbers. So it took me about eight hours of fiddling with this through the tag, and then I said, PowerShell is my friend, and <laughs> there was absolutely no problems doing that configuration in PowerShell. And Reality is, if you're doing, if you're doing location information services to the granularity of port numbers, you're not going to be doing this in the Teams Admin Center. You're going to script all of this up because that would just be, man, carpet tunnel. Your, you know, your doctor will be happy with you because you're, you're down there constantly, right? So. But just something to be aware of, you know, if you are doing it as a mock-up and you're fighting with the port number and it's not taken, it's just an idiot thing to see in the Teams Admin Center. Go to PowerShell and you'll be all good. <sighs> Wi-Fi, same thing, we got to define all the Wi-Fi access points. Wi-Fi nowadays can have so many darn BSSIDs or different zones, you know. Even at home, I'm running, like, I've got my, this is my corporate entity, this is what I'm doing work for. Here's my IoT network, right? It's uh, for all my stupid Netflix devices and whatever else, you know. Oh, I have a special network for my friends that are coming in because 
they don't need to be on the same network as my home office machine that I'm used to doing work on for large multinationals. So we all segregate our Wi-Fi networks nowadays, right? So you, tip, you can typically have up to about 15, uh, 16 BSSIDs on the same wireless access point. And again, I don't want to deal with having to constantly manage this and be that granular. But luckily, this is a tip that Adam showed me, my boss Adam, the last octet or the last number in the last octet can be a star, and typically the access points are going zero through F. So when you are defining an access point, define it and, and just star out the last digit. And you're doing a little bit of a wildcard there. Emergency calling policy or as I call it, emergency notification policy. It is getting a little bit broader now, but this is the policy you define, you tag it to a network site of who to notify when somebody calls 911. So again, if I'm in LA, people in LA gets notified that I'm calling 911. If I'm in New York, people in New York gets notified that I'm calling 911. Again, some idiosyncrasies I've found is that I always, you can do two things. You can either associate people directly with the policy that are being notified, or you can associate a group and then make people a member of the group. I found the latter to work better for a couple of reasons. If you define, a, if, if you define people directly, there's, a, there's an, again, another idiosyncrasy I found. If you are in an organization where your SIP address and your SMTP address and your UPN is different, then you can't assign people directly. It doesn't work. People don't get notified. And again, in some larger global organizations, your UPN and your SIP address may not be the same as your email address. The documentation says you have to add your email address into a team's emergency notification list that is a group chat. And it makes absolutely no sense that it's an SMTP address you have to add. But that's, can't fix that, so there's a workaround. Don't associate people directly. The downside is that you now need to have exchange admin rights to create the group and assign members to the group, okay? But it works well with groups. The upside of doing it in a group is you can make a safety officer at that local place a, uh, an owner of the group and you can allow people to self-manage it so it doesn't require IT to add new employees to the group. Questions? Practical items. Put common area phones out there, please. We don't all run around with laptops and cell phones and if something happens, if you're already putting first aid stations out there, you've got AEDs out there, stick a freaking common area phone out there. Sign it. I was at a hotel a couple of years ago, and it says 911 phones located at the Westgate entrance. I'm going like, damn it. I used to be a Boy Scout, but I forgot my compass. Where is that Westgate, Westgate entrance, right? You know, you, you, you got to make it really obvious, right? So if you are putting phones out there, don't put signage up that, that requires you to have local knowledge of what's going on there, right? The same thing you saw, we were talking about Riverside building, floor one, zone three. Well, out in the driveway when the first responders are coming in, if you've got multiple buildings, you better have some signage out there that says Riverside building, Collins building, home building, whatever. And when they start entering the doors, 
How do we get to the different floors? How do we get to the different zones? So signage is very, very important that, you know, that you're thinking this stuff through. This is not just a technical thing. Don't put people on a notification list. Oh, we'll just put the receptionist on the notification list and, tell, and forget to tell her about it. And then somebody calls 911 and she gets her pops and team and go like, holy shit, what am I, what am I gonna do here, you know? So again, these decisions have to go outside of IT. And I typically, when I run projects, says, this is not an IT decision. You gotta go back to HR. If you do have a safety department or, or security department, let's go back to those guys. You guys really need to map out what are the procedures for if somebody calls 911 so that, you know, what are we doing? Because it does set up a group chat. And you want to have local people on that chat. So again, in global deployments, I've, I've had people from headquarters that are part of HR that are being notified about it, but they can't really do anything about it because they're not local, but they know what, that, that somebody in a branch had a 911 call, and then you have no local people that can, again, somebody needs to get to the person who's calling to offer CPR or first aid, and you gotta have somebody else running out in the street to meet the first responders. Again, you wanna make sure the signage is out there, so they know which driveway to come into, which door to enter the building, and, and so on. So, yeah, have a plan. How many here has VVX phones in their organization? Get rid of them. Okay. The problem is not their location information. They can, we can do that on static 911 because the phone doesn't move. So we can tag a phone number of that phone to a room in the building and that goes out to PSAP. But the problem is when you make a 911 call from that phone, nobody else knows that you're making a 911 call and you are not complying to the FCC regulations. But wait a minute, you are, because there's a loophole in the regulations that says, if the system doesn't support it, you don't have to do it. And that's why I'm saying, <clears throat> don't look at the regulation, go above and beyond because you're dealing with people's lives here. Okay? So get rid of those. In the US, you shouldn't see any three pip phones anymore because it's, it's, it's <sighs> the expense of replacing those three pip phones with the expense of the pending lawsuit you're gonna have for a wrongful debt lawsuit is gonna be different, right? So if you are having that many VVX phones, there are third parties. You can do a tab on the SPC that can do notifications, the uh, uh, emergency gateways are, are out there from some of their manufacturers and stuff, but we're talking about you're supporting thousands and thousands of VVX phones or, or three bit phones. If you're down to having just a couple of hundred phones, just replace them. Our wonderful sponsors? Questions, comments? We have, we have, we have a, we have a box for you. Uh, my question is, what do you see people doing um, with the emergency calling policies when there's an unmuted and muted option? I'm asked what the best practice is, and I just kind of want to know what you see people doing. So. When you're doing out to a conference call, again, you gotta go back to the business, go back to HR, talk to them about what you really wanna do. My, my preference is 
Generally, we just do notification that's very non-intrusive. Um, if you do conference people in, don't blare it out over a PA system, for example, because Torin brought up a good point earlier today. We have an active shooter. I'm calling 911. We're hiding here in the, the uh, uh, principal's office. Well, now the active shooter knows exactly where you are, right? So it may be OK to conference out to a, a, a safety department. I typically don't, and again, it comes down to planning. If you want somebody to be able to be two-way on that conference call, there may be reasons why you want to do that. But if you're dealing with a secretary that's working front desk, and she's impeding the conversation that the victim is having with PSAP, now you've got a huge problem, right? So a lot of this stuff, we don't really dictate because we're just technical. It becomes part of an, an overall conversation that we're having with uh, uh, safety, security, and human resources. And there are, I've, I've come up a couple of times, Patrick was, called me the other day and said, I have a college that needs call recording, but only on 911 calls. And we have a call recording partner here today. My first thing is like, are you crazy? Why, why is the entity going to call, record that call? Because PSAP is already doing it. Have, have you talked to general counsel about the privacy implications in this? But there are call recording partners out there. One of them is a sponsor here that can do call recording of just 911 calls. Other questions? Uh, yes. Oh, you need the box. Oh, yes. <laughs> so you said uh, around the, the three pit phones not you know, working properly with notifications and stuff for, for E911. What about uh, the Teams uh, Tip Voice Gateway where third party phones were? Uh, Cisco or I, 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 I can't guess, but I don't think that's going to be supported either. So uh, again, it, it, it's kind of a, the, you know, people are asking for the SIP gateway, but I think they're asking for it for the wrong reasons. The right reasons for a SIP gateway is, in my opinion, those kind of off the wall scenarios where you have a door phone for somebody to call in and say, I'm here, open the gate. Or an elevator, not even an elevator phone, because that becomes an emergency phone now, too. Uh, so paging system, for example, where it's one-way paging. That's where I see the SIP gateway being a really, really good stopgap for dealing with some of these off-ball needs we have in the SIP world. As a user phone, absolutely, you got to get off the SIP phones. Nope. And, and if you start looking at what it's going to cost you to take an existing Avaya or audio codes or Cisco or whatever SIP phone, have to flip the firmware, have to reconfigure them, have to program them, have to register them against that SIP service, probably going to end up cheaper by just buying a, a new Teams phone and letting users self-register. Other questions? Please fill out your evaluation sheets. Thank you.